went to, to um, Korea, I shaved my head, lived as a Zen monk, and for the second time in my life, I found myself in a community that was eating basically what we would call today a vegan diet, didn't eat, didn't eat any meat, dairy products, or eggs, didn't wear wool, silk, or leather, didn't even kill mosquitoes, really, unless, I mean, no, you didn't do it, you just kind of put them outside. So the whole idea was, um, we were doing a lot of meditation, and the idea was to cultivate an attitude of kindness and compassion for all life, and this was a community that was living in this way, what we would call today a vegan lifestyle, for 650 years, so it wasn't some new hippie kind of thing, it was uh, an ancient tradition that had its foundation in an ancient spiritual practice of ahimsa. How many of you have heard of ahimsa? Ahimsa is an old Sanskrit word, right? It just means non-violence. And the basic teaching is um, that, and I think this is a universal teaching really through all the religions, that, uh, that ethical behavior is behavior that is non-violent, that we, that violence breeds, breeds not only unhappiness for others, fear and uh, harm and so forth, but it also breeds unhappiness for ourselves. It is a form of bondage. It is perhaps the source of all bondage is violence towards others. You know, I'm going to manipulate another for my own good. I'm going to harm them for my own good. I'm going to kill them or steal from them or use them sexually. You know, anything that we do to harm another for my own benefit was contrary to uh, the wisdom teachings of all the religions. In fact, I think, uh, in many ways, if we could boil down the essential teachings of all the religions to one sentence, it would probably be something like, whatever you most want for yourself, give that to others. You know, whatever we most want, give that. If we want to be free and happy, then work to help others be free and happy. And if we want to be loved, then be loving. Whatever we sow, we will reap. This idea of whatever we put out will come back. In the World Peace Diet, I talk about um, the boomerang effect. You know, whatever we, whatever we put out comes back. And um, this essential teaching, though, I realized when I was in Korea, uh, we were meditating from you know, about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock at night. And it was this gradual, it was almost like extricating myself slowly as the months went on out of a lot of the brambles of conditioning of our culture, I began to realize that I had been born into a culture that this essential teaching, which is really obvious, I think, to us as uh, spiritual beings, as, as somewhat intelligent human beings, that we don't get, get that essential teaching in this culture, that we think somehow that we can manipulate and use others for our own benefit and that we can get away with it. And everything will be fine. We can just use others. And the interesting thing is that human beings very often, and it depends, there's sort of um, uh, categories, I guess you would say, of, uh, and hierarchies of privilege in our culture. So if we harm others that have enough privilege, then we pay the price, right? We'll go to jail or pay a fine or they'll hit us back or whatever. But there are certain beings, when you get lower down on the, on the, uh, on the status privilege like animals, and especially animals used for food, you can do the most horrific things to them. You can confine them and steal their babies and mutilate their bodies and just horrific things and actually be very you know, wealthy and have a powerful voice in Congress and be highly respected. And so this is the essential thing that, that there are, they, these animals cannot retaliate. Whatever we do to them, they just take it. The interesting thing is that our violence towards them does retaliate in, in very fascinating ways. And I think the, one of the greatest adventures of understanding that anyone in this culture can embark on is the adventure of understanding how the violence in this culture towards animals for food and other products reverberates and comes back to us. And I think if we started to see that and understand it, we would stop doing it. And I think we would begin to realize that the only reason that anyone in this culture eats animal foods is because they've been forced to do it from birth by every institution in our culture. No one does it out of their own free choice. And no one wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I'm gonna, what would it be like to have, you know, the, the, to take the milk of a mother cow and, and then maybe mix it with the, uh, with the, stomach lining of a calf and add some salt and age it. Wow, what would that be like? <laughs> but if you 
but we would be given these packages of cheese, you know, or different things, and little styrofoam wrap, plastic wrap, pieces of flesh, and we're told that this is normal and, and just what we have to eat, how we eat in this culture. And so the essential uh, teaching is a teaching in our culture of disconnectedness. And I think this is the, the thing to understand at the very beginning is that no one does this of their own features. When we go outside here after this is over, we see people walking around and eating meat, dairy, and eggs, and so forth, that they're only doing it because they were raised in a community of people doing that. And for me, the great liberation, in a sense, that, that I feel so grateful for was that I was able to live in communities of people who were not eating animal foods, like the farm and some of saw Zen temple, and for, not, for long enough that, and to realize that I don't have to do that. And so I think one of the most powerful things we can do is to help create communities uh, where we live this way. They can be communities physically, they can be communities online, they can be vegetarian societies, but something to help create a context to help others to make this transition because um, the sense is that if we don't make the transition from, from the way of eating that's been going on for the last eight or 10,000 years, that it's really at the core of this culture. It's a really, in a lot of ways, it's a, uh, a spinning fury at the core of our culture that is, I think, generating most of the problems that we're having. If we're not able to see that and change our behavior as a culture, then we will continue on, and the technology that we have is amplifying our violence. We're killing 75 million animals a day now, and for food, and it's, this is mind-boggling. But the, as the technology amplifies the violence, we're, we're finding ourselves more and more devastating the ecosystems and creating more uh, context for violence against each other, that we will, obviously this will continue <laughs> to accelerate, and it is continuing to accelerate, and we will commit geocide and suicide, and we won't even know why it happened. We won't know what, what was the driving reason. And the, I think the beauty of this understanding is that we realize that we have inherited an obsolete mentality. So, for example, in the World Peace Study, I go through several chapters that just sort of lay this out, and I'll, and I'll do this just very briefly because tonight I think, you know, the, the main thing is to just try to give some of these ideas and, um, and, and then talk about it. So, the very first chapter is just about the power of food. I've already mentioned that somewhat, but I'll say maybe one more thing, and that is, Every institution in our culture is oriented around and agrees on the essential, they don't agree on everything, but they agree on this, that there are certain animals that are put here you know, for us to eat, right? I mean, when I was a little kid and, and I started getting, maybe for the first time, flesh of animals, I was, you know, we lose our mother's breast, we start getting food, right, from, our, from the people we trust the most. And if you just go to any grocery store and look at the little baby jars, you'll see right there, veal, chicken, turkey, beef, cheese. So we start getting this kind of food. And it's not just from the family, but also from you know, my ministers and my, from church and from school, education, government, um, uh, corporations, the media, I mean, everywhere. It's just, there's no dissenting voice on this. This is what we're supposed to do. And it's basically the subtext of every meal is that we're essentially predators because we're given the flesh of the animals who have been stabbed to eat. And this predatory mentality is really the opposite of the mentality uh, of every religion. For example, the Buddhist tradition is the idea of the Bodhisattva. Right? The Bodhisattva is someone who is living their life to bless others. And uh, when the uh, you know, predatory mentality is looking with eyes and, and seeing others and thinking, well, how can I get what I want from them? How, you know, and basically, it's a we lock those people up, you know, typically, I mean, predatory, predatory uh, behavior, and yet we create a predatory economic system, we create a basic system of might makes right, and I think we see this in the food, essentially. So it's the subtext of every meal, essentially, is reducing beings to things, to commodities, a uh, mentality of excluding others from the sphere of our compassion, a mentality of reductionism, of disconnectedness, of predation, of privilege, of, of elitism, because the, again, the essential message in every meal is that certain beings are just inherently superior to others and are entitled to use them. Because that's what we're eating. Every single time we eat meat, dairy, and eggs, we're eating that we are inherently superior and we're here to use them. And so it's, it essentially undermines our inherent compassion in a very profound way 
to, to get this message from every dimension of our culture, and yet that's what's going on. So, food is enormously powerful, and uh, cross-culturally, this is something that's recognized. We don't see it in our culture because we're so busy very often, and we're eating while we're driving, and while we're having business meetings, and while we're watching television. But actually, food is our most intimate connection with nature and with our culture as well. And then, um, just looking at the history of this, I think it's very empowering too, because, like I said, eight or 10,000 years ago was the first time people started to own animals for food. So this is a relatively recent development, and it took a long time to happen. It didn't just happen overnight. And so very gradually, people started owning sheep and goats that they had been hunting before then, they became property. And then about 2,000 years later, it was cows. And I think this revolution was amazing because beings went from being mysterious cohabitants of the earth with us to being mere property. And they became despicable as this process went on over the centuries, over again, over many centuries. And, uh, you know, like today, there's nothing worse you can say to someone than to call them a pig or a turkey or a chicken or a cow. You know, we have to reduce them in order to harm them. So, this is what happened. It's very interesting to see that with this basic reorientation of the culture to owning animals for food, then it opened the door to owning other people. We had the arising of slavery. We had the arising of a wealthy elite class that basically was wealthy because it owned the capital. Capita comes from the old Latin word capita, which means head, as in head of livestock. So, the fastest way for them to get rich was to breed animals and have more, and then also to do something that hadn't been done before, which was to mass a attack on someone else, another king, uh, as we call him today, who owned a lot, a wealthy elite who owned a lot of the animals. And if they won this war, in the very first wars, they would get all of that livestock. They'd be suddenly much wealthier. Does this sound like a familiar story? When, when the rich want to get richer, they go to war, right? And this has been going on. And this is the underlying dynamic, and the people suffer enormously. The people who lost, I mean, it's really, you know, it's very depressing to read about the history of that time because there was an enormous, it was a really violent time. And you had the first, um, you know, women would become concubines and men would become slaves if they, if they lost the war. So you had this whole hardening of the hearts of men. And by the time the historic period emerged, and we had the very first writings. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the Old Testament writers, it's very clear to see this is exactly what's happening. Women are bought and sold like chattel property. Um, there's this wealthy elite class. They're always going to war. You have slavery. And uh, land is now seen as being owned. And this whole culture was very bellicose. And the men were disconnected from their natural compassion. It started to it spread throughout the Mediterranean, the northern Mediterranean, Europe came here. Uh, and I think this basic way of looking at the world and of living um, has been spreading ever since. And it's spreading right now through the transnational corporations and especially the big uh, food, you know, the, the Monsanto and ConAgra, McDonald's, Burger King, and these. Um, many corporations, and sometimes I refer to it as you know, Ropi Stein as the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media complex. You know, there's this powerful complex that gets very wealthy on people eating this way, eating foods of death, uh, and on the uh, drugs that are necessary, the sicknesses that come from that. And I think it's what we realize is that it's time uh, for us to, to look deeply into. Uh, what actually goes on in the food production system, and also to realize, I think this is important too, that from the very beginning, it's been the female animals that have been most violated, that have been most violently abused, because it's the female animals that bring forth the babies, and it's been not just the female animals, but specifically their uteruses and mammary glands, it's that men have dominated, and the very first science actually was men learning how to dominate female animals and to have babies that would have more, give more milk and have more fur and have more flesh on them. And this whole manipulation of nature um, through eating animal foods, that this creates a basic mentality.